Tada! The movement phase. The movement phase is divided into three sub-phases. First, charge. Second, compulsory moves. And third, remaining moves. Here are a few general principles for moving. Models will always move now according to their move characteristic. In the case of this Empire Archer now, which is a human being, we have a movement rate of four inches. So he can move four inches in any direction as part of his normal move over crates um, that are one inch or lower, uh, over any sort of obstacles. He can even move up ladders a total of four inches, um, and he can move in any direction. The benefit of a normal move is simply this. If we were to move our normal four inches, this model would still be allowed to shoot in the shooting phase. If he were to run uh, in contrast, which is double his normal movement, he would not be able to shoot. So were this archer to run, he would be able to move up to eight inches. So that could bring him potentially all the way over here. It is important to remember, however, that a model can only run if there are no enemy models within eight inches of it at the start of the turn. Once again, fleeing, stunned, knockdown, and hidden models do not count. So for example, in this case of the archer, um, this orc boy is within eight inches. So were he to attempt to run, we would then measure it and see that he is in fact within eight inches, which would mean he could only go his normal four. Were the orc boy further than eight inches away, it is possible then for this archer to run within eight inches of him. But remember, the only way to engage another model is to declare a charge at the beginning of the movement phase. And once again, were this model to run, he would be unable to shoot in this phase, although it is still possible to cast spells after running. Charging. If you want a model to engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, then you must make a special move called a charge. Without measuring the distance, declare that your model is charging and indicate which enemy model he is going to attack. In this case, we will have this archer declare a charge upon this orc boy. Remember that it is only possible to charge if your model is able to draw a direct line of sight to the model that it will be charging. In this case, there is nothing obstructing the view here, so we can say there is indeed a direct line of sight. Were this orc boy to be hidden behind these crates blocking the line of sight, then it would not be possible for this archer to declare a charge. It is nevertheless still possible for your model to charge an enemy that it cannot see if it is within four inches of that model. Now the model may be behind a corner or in this case behind boxes. And it's important to know, however, that the model that is out of line of sight has not been declared as hidden. We will talk a bit about hiddenness in a little bit. Let us say then that this orc boy is out of line of sight of this archer, but he is not indeed hidden. The archer is within four inches, so he can declare a charge if he passes an initiative test. In this case, we have an initiative of three, so let's roll our d6, and he gets a five, which means he fails. A failed initiative test means that he may move as normal, shoot and cast spells as normal, but he may not charge. Had the archer passed his initiative test, say if he rolled a two, he then would be able to come into combat with this orc boy, even though the orc boy began out of his line of sight. Charging, therefore, is something like a running move in that it is double the distance of a normal movement, but what this does is it brings our models into base-to-base -base contact, which means that they are now in combat. Models may even be considered to be in combat if they are separated by a low wall. In this case, even though their bases are not touching, they are said to fight their combat over the wall and over the obstacle. An important rule to take consideration of when charging is the intercepting rule. What the intercepting rule means is that a model may not charge if there is another model within two inches of the charging route. 
Were the model to declare a charge, it would then be intercepted. So let's take this example now of the archer and the orc boys. Were this orc boy in the middle to be three inches out of the line that we draw between these two, this archer would still be able to charge and the orc boy would not be able to intercept. Were this orc boy in the middle though, within a two inch distance, when this guy attempts to charge, what will happen is he will be intercepted by this other orc. What that means then is that these two models will then be in combat. For the sake of simplicity then, instead of charging over here, it is possible then for this guy simply to declare a charge onto him. Remember that there's no pre-measuring now in declaring charges, so sometimes a charging warrior may not reach the enemy because you have miscalculated the distance. So for example, in this case, the Empire Archer here has a charge range of 8. Were you to declare a charge, you would have to measure it out and see if it would be possible. Once we have made our measurement, we see now that the Empire Archer is indeed beyond his charge range. He has an 11 inch distance to the other model. This would therefore be a failed charge, and what we would do then is to move our Archer his normal movement of 4 inches. Having failed this charge, this model may now not shoot this turn, although if he is able to, he may cast spells. An additional important point, the only way that it is possible to come into combat with another model is by declaring a charge. Any movement that brings you into base-to-base -base contact in combat is therefore by definition a charge. If you can move your warrior into base contact with more than one enemy model with its charge move, it can charge them both. So for example, with this Empire Archer, he may declare a charge on one of those orc boys, and he may in fact move up to the point where his base is in contact with both. In this combat, we therefore have three models now who will be fighting. Now this move might indeed be inadvisable for this archer in that he will now be fighting two enemies at once. The hiding rule. The hiding rule represents warriors concealing themselves in a way that are unmoving and dramatically posed models cannot. A hiding warrior keeps as still as possible, just peeking out of cover. A model can hide if he ends his move behind a low wall, a column, or in a similar position where he could reasonably conceal himself, say behind certain obstacles. The player must declare that the warrior is hiding and place a hidden counter beside the model for it to count as being hidden. So for example, were this archer now to end his move behind this big pile of crates and other items, we could say that he is now hidden. We will declare him hidden and put a hidden marker on him. It is important to remember that this is a special move, so a model that runs, flees, is stunned, or charges cannot hide that turn. His sudden burst of speed does not give him time to hide. A model may stay hidden for several turns so long as he stays behind a wall or similar feature or obstruction. He may even move around so long as he stays hidden while doing so. So for example, we may say that this archer may continue along this wall of obstacles and remain hidden the entire time. Were an enemy model now to move into a position where he would be able to see the hidden warrior, the hidden warrior is no longer hidden and removes his hidden counter. Hiding is a great benefit for this reason. When hidden, a model cannot be seen, shot at, or charged. Say for example that this were an orc error boy and he moved up to this position and he did not have line of sight on our archer over here, he would not be able to shoot and neither would he be able to charge that archer. Of course, were this orc able to move into a position where he would then be able to see the archer, the archer would then lose his hidden status. To maintain its hidden status now, this archer cannot shoot or cast spells. If it does so, it reveals its position and then can be shot at and charged at as normal. A model may not hide if he is too close to an enemy model. He will be seen or heard no matter how well concealed. Enemy warriors will always see, hear, or otherwise detect hidden foes within their initiative value in inches. So for example, were this archer to be here, 
he would not be able to be hidden because this orc boy has an initiative of two, which means he can see all hidden figurines and warriors within two inches. Let us briefly say something about terrain in Mordheim. Open ground. The tabletop surface, the floors of buildings, and connecting overhangs, ladders, and ropes are all considered to be open ground and will not affect movement even if the model is charging. The model can also go through doors and hatches without slowing down. Difficult ground. Difficult ground includes steep or treacherous slopes, bushes, and the angled roofs of buildings. Models move at half speed over difficult terrain. So for example, if our archer were climbing on this angled roof, he would only be able to move two inches instead of his normal four. Very difficult ground. This is really dangerous terrain such as narrow crawl holes through the rubble. Models may move at a quarter rate. So for example, if our model here moves four inches over open ground, it can only move one inch over difficult ground. In this case, to move through this small crawl hole. Walls and barriers. Walls, hedges, and other low obstacles form barriers that you can either go around or leap over. A model can leap over a barrier that is less than one inch high. This does not affect movement in any way. So in this case with this Empire Archer, he is able to cross this low wall which is less than an inch high without any hindrance to his movement. And of course a good rule of thumb with terrain is always talk to your opponent before you begin games and talk about the different kinds of terrain pieces and come up with some agreed upon definitions so that you can avoid having conflicts about those pieces later. Oftentimes the ruined buildings of Mordheim did not have stairs or ladders so your warriors will have to climb to reach the upper floors of buildings. Any model except for animals can climb up or down fences, walls, etc. Now he must be touching what he wants to climb at the start of his movement phase. He may climb up to his total movement in a single movement phase, but cannot run while he is climbing. Any remaining movement can be used as normal. If the height is more than the model's normal move, he cannot climb the wall. So for example, in this case of the archer who has a normal movement of four, he is unable to climb this wall in that it is almost five inches tall. Were he, however, to have begun his movement phase touching the wall on top of this crate, the distance would then be less than four inches and he would then be able to successfully climb this wall and move on to the edge of the platform. In order to begin to climb, however, the model must first pass an initiative test. In this case, with our archer, we have an initiative of three. So we will roll a d6, and we got it with a two. In this case, he is now able to climb up the wall. Were he have to fail the initiative test, if he rolled, for example, a four, five, or a six, he would not be able to climb up, and he would not be able to move any more that turn. In contrast, if the archer were to fail his initiative test while climbing down, he would fall from where he started his descent. We will talk more about this when we talk about falling. Jumping down. Your warrior may jump down from high places up to a maximum height of six inches, such as walkways and balconies, at any time during his movement phase. Take an initiative test for every full two inches he jumps down. So for example, let's say this archer wants to jump down from here, and let's say for the, this example that this is exactly six inches. He will have to take an initiative test for each two inch increment, so a total of three initiative tests. If the archer fails any of the tests, he falls from the point where he jumped, and he takes damage, which we'll discuss in the falling section, and he may not move any more during the movement phase. If he's successful, however, the model can continue his movement as normal. Jumping down does not use up any of the model's movement allowance. So to return to this example, our archer could move one inch to the end, jump down to six inches. If he passes all of his tests, he could still move three more inches, and that would be a normal move. It is also possible to carry out what is called a diving charge. You may charge any enemy troops that are below a balcony or overhang, etc., that your model is on. If an enemy model is within two inches of the place where your warrior lands, he may make a diving charge against it. 
So for example, were this orc boy here to be within two inches of where this archer would land, he can now make a diving charge against that orc boy. So once again, we need to take an initiative test for each full two inches of height that our model jumps down up to a maximum of six inches. So once again, three more initiative tests. If we were to fail any one of those three tests, our model would simply fall down and take damage where he lands. He would not be able to move anymore during his movement phase and he cannot charge the enemy. Were he successful then, having passed three initiative tests, he would be able to jump down, land here and come into base contact with that model, thus receiving his plus one strength bonus and plus one hit bonus for the next hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. Jumping over gaps. Models may jump over gaps and streets up to a maximum of three inches. So for example, from the roof of a building to another. Deduct the distance jump from the model's movement, but remember that you cannot measure the distance before jumping. If your model does not have enough movement to jump the distance, he automatically falls. So in the case of this archer, I had declared that I would like to jump. Now I have a movement of four inches, and after I declare the jump, I go and measure it, and I see that it is exactly three inches, so he will be able to make that jump. Once we know we were able to make the jump, we then have to take an initiative test. With a roll of two, we now pass the initiative test, which means that we are able to make this jump successfully. We move our three inches across, and we can even move an additional one inch to end right there. Now it is possible to make the jump while running, which might be smart because you'll have extra distance when you land on the other side of your three inch maximum jump. Having made the leap, this archer may now shoot as long as he did not run uh, and use missile weapons like normal. In the shooting section, we will talk a bit more about what it means to be knocked down or stunned. But for now, we can just simply note that if a warrior is knocked down or stunned when standing within one inch of the edge of a roof or building, there's a chance that it will slip and fall off. So in this case of the archer, we need to take an initiative test. If the test is failed, the model falls over the edge of the ground and takes damage as detailed below in falling. If, however, for example, this archer does pass the initiative test and is simply knocked down, we will just lay him down like we would normally without having him fall off the ledge. Falling. A model that falls takes D3 hits at a strength equal to the height in inches that it fell. So for example, with this archer who is six inches above the ground, were he to fall off of here for any reason, whether being hit or whether he tries to jump down and does not successfully make it, he will now take D3 hits at strength six because he is six inches above the ground. And of course, no armor saves are allowed for wounds taken by falling. Let's say now that the archer fell off of that uh, platform and he will now take D3 hits. So that will be a total of two hits. And strength six fall versus a toughness of three, we'll be wounding on twos, and there is one wound. It is important to note that falling will not cause critical hits. We'll talk more about critical hits in the hand-to-hand -hand combat section. Would our archer have survived the fall, he would not be able to move or hide at all in the remainder of this turn. 